This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. G'day, everybody. Thanks for joining me. Much appreciated. In this chat, I bring to you a conversation with Al Jorgensen. Now, the catalyst for the conversation was the launch of the 2018 album from Ministry titled America Can't, so KKK Can't. Al shares his insights about the album, and he reflects on the 1996 masterpiece Filth Pig. And uh, American has a close relationship with Phil P- Filth Pig, as you'll hear Al explain. And he also delves deep into an assessment of various prominent political topics that I bring up. Now, the discussion was so engaging that the opportunity for a part two was brought up by Al, and I didn't follow up, unfortunately. So I'm kicking myself about that now, but uh, hopefully there will be another conversation with the great man in the near future. So here he is, the great Al Jorgensen. Uncle Al, it's Andy McKay-Smith calling from Queensland in Australia. Sir, how are you? Hello, Andy. I'm doing well. It's a pleasure to chat to you, mate. Before we get things underway, I've just got to congratulate you on a stellar career. I've been following it since at least Psalm 69, and um, Filth Pig is an album that's made its way into my top 10 albums of all time. It's an album that I truly love, so I just wanted to get the fanboy in me out of the way before we kick off, if that's okay, <laughs> and say thank you so much for creating that, Filth that's Pig. That's fantastic, but it's, it's funny you mentioned Filth Pig because this album, this new album, is so similar in my mind to that album so Hmm. let's talk about it okay so yeah i've only listened to it a couple of times because i only got a copy yesterday so on that note how is it similar to filth pig because i know that there's a lot of i mean there always is a lot of so-called politically you know when i say so-called politically charged lyrics you're always being very observant and you do have a social conscience so how is it similar is it due to the lyrics or the way that you frame some of the musicality uh, it's the way that we frame the musicality. Uh, the lyrics are completely different than Phil Pig. Phil Pig was a person album, person, personal album, more about, um, you know, uh, things that were going on personally for me in my life at the time. This is much more of a social activist album. But uh, in the framework of the music and, and the process that it was done, it's the first time since Phil Pig that I've actually been in a studio with a full band recorded live. So in that sense, um, instead of just me and an engineer and computers, mm. um, and then do all you know, fix it and mix later. This is seventy-five to eighty-five percent of this album was recorded in one week in a studio in uh, Los Angeles uh, with a live band. So in that sense, it's much different than other than, than previous Ministry records since since like mid nineties. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so that was that was exciting for me. I, I, God, I really wish you could uh, were able to hear this record a few more times uh, before we talk, and maybe um, maybe we could even set up a follow up after this yeah, cool, interview, man. where uh, after you listen to it a few times, because I'm I'm that convinced that this is probably the best work I've I've ever done uh, under the name Ministry, anyways. Well, that's a pretty strong statement, if you don't mind me um, giving you that feedback. I mean, you've had some tremendous albums in your time. I mean, I, I'm a, even a big fan of your early synth pop work. I think there was a lot of innovation in that that I could hear carry on through a lot of the bands that more, more sort of underground pop bands throughout the 80s and into the 90s. But, you know, there's one song in your career that I actually do hold above all others. So I want to ask for your comment about the track Paisley, because it wasn't released on an album, I don't think. I had it on a copy of the Escape from LA soundtrack. But Paisley, tell me about that track, you know, is it an important track in the canon of work that you've you've released as an artist under ministry? Well, outside of you and me, <laughs> it wasn't. But yes, to, to me, and and it's funny that there, every so often around the world, as, as I travel over the years, I get somebody that comes up and asks me about that song, and and that song um, was. Um, against better judgment and against uh, all odds, everyone else hated that song in the band at the time. My management hated really? it. Everyone hated it. And I just, uh, yeah, and I just decided to record it. And uh, I was in a, a real crisis mode personally uh, while recording that song. That song was um, the the last gasp 
of uh, of of a deranged junkie, basically. Mm. Um, I, I didn't know how to beat beat my addiction, and uh, it was a cry for help kind of thing. I don't mean to get all you know mushy on you and shit, but uh, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. that song was about to be, it, it it didn't mean a lot to anybody else. So. No, I had <laughs> but <I'm>... whatever. <laughs> I recorded it, and uh, I stand by it. Oh, I'm glad you do, mate. Yeah, there's there's actually a live a copy of a live recording on YouTube where Barker's bass is up so loud that it drowns out everything else. He's playing an acoustic bass. Have you seen that YouTube video? Uh, yeah, that was uh, the Bridge Benefit where we did an acoustic kind of ministry type of set uh, at the behest of Neil Young, uh, who's a buddy of ours, and. Uh, mm. He asked us to do his bridge benefit that he has every year or had every year. I don't know if it's still going. I think they just canceled it last year. Um, but, uh, yeah, we had like three days rehearsal and we just decided to do that. And I think we did a couple Grateful Dead covers and Lay Lady Lay and a couple other things to make it all acoustic. And, uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, that 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 day was a that was a trip that day. Trust me, <laughs> but either way, yeah, it was fun. Well, um, as far as to you know, what my impetus is is to sing about social activities. I, I, I take breaks from that. I mean, um, uh, and it's funny because everyone pretty much, it, it's it's kind of frustrating, but everyone associates ministry with like, okay, a right-wing government is in power in the United States, and so ministry is going to make a good hardcore album. Hmm. And then whenever uh, Democrats or the left-wing is, uh, we suck, which... You know, things like Phil Pig and all that, I don't think suck, but what they are is a deviation from just commenting on, on, on uh, you know, uh, social uh, conditions and, and going into more personal things. Hmm. Um, so this, this one um, is also uh, social commentary, but it's, it's not social commentary in, in the usual format that I do it in. This is, this is much more about the, the system that produces people like Donald Trump than it is about Donald Trump. Hmm. I mean, Donald Trump is very low-hanging fruit. I mean, uh, you know, I, I spent uh, almost a decade doing anti-Bush records and railing against Bush to the point to where uh, the third album of that trilogy, I was feeling as sorry for him as I was for us as humanity. Hmm. Um, just realizing that we're all part of this system and and this has been coming out in my music, um, uh, you know, uh, content-wise, uh, lyrically, uh, since um, after From Beer to Eternity into Surgical Meth Machine, I, I just started looking at the bigger picture. Hmm. And, and this album is a much bigger picture, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, rage against the machine, if you will, kind of thing, as opposed to, you know, we hate Bush, we hate Trump, we hate Reagan, we hate you know, Malcolm Turnbull, we hate whoever, you know, uh, uh, these individuals, these individuals are just like cysts, okay? You go to a doctor with a large lump on your neck, Mm. and they remove the cyst, but they don't ask you, like, why that cyst is there. You probably have cancer, okay? And and this album is more about the cancer that invades and permeates all of society as opposed to the figurehead that's espousing its, you know... uh, it's it's venom, you know. So um, th- this album goes a little bit deeper than just like you know. Okay, oh Al Sachs is a Republican president, and so yeah. he's mad, and he's throwing a tantrum, and he's going to rail against Trump now. Okay, it's, it's a little bit more than that. I mean, to, yes. to, to me, this this album is, is is pretty much like the audio equivalent of like say Charlie Brooker's Black Mirror, right? Where he just he holds a mirror up to society and says, okay, this is where we're at. This is where we're going. Are you sure you want to be part of this? And, uh, and my answer is, of course, uh, you know, <laughs> no fucking way. But um, it, it's, it's, it's more of a purview of, of an overall global sociological condition and the system that produces that, whether it be through social media or politics or religion or what have you, mm-hmm. what kind of systems have we created? And so that's, that's what this album is much more about. Tell me about the song TV54Chan. 
Which one? Is it, It's TV5 4chan on the new album. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. The 4chan, yeah, yeah. The 4chan one is, is, is a continuation of things that I've been doing um, for, for years, uh, well, 20 years now. Uh, we have a series of the TV songs, uh, starting on Psalm 69, um, uh, it, it went through Phil Pig. Uh, I had it on Surgical Meth Machine. So this is this is the fifth installation of, of just uh, Burroughs and uh, Brion Gisson type cut-ups of um, once again a Black Mirror thing. Where like, look, yep. this is what we're actually hearing every day. Yes. This is what you're actually going on on your computers and hearing. Uh, do you like this? Because I don't, you know, so it's, it's purposely meant to be annoying. And I've been doing that for about 20 years. I like the way you, you nestled it in between. Cause yeah, it does come on pretty strong in between the song with the title victims of a clown. So we can all, we don't have to guess who you're talking about there potentially. And also something, uh, probably the most profound title, uh, of any of the songs on the new album, we're tired of it. Yeah, well, that that comes right out of, uh, of the the four chan um, cut up that I did, and and we are tired of it. Um, mm-hmm. And Burton Bell from Fear Factory actually wrote the lyrics to that one. Uh, he was around for the whole recording process. We're old buddies from about twenty years, you know, yeah. ongoing. And uh, and 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 he happened to be uh, his schedule was perfect to where he was off at the time, so he was just hanging around the studio, basically being a pest. And I finally just said, "Well, fucking do something." And so he came up with these <laughs> lyrics uh, after hearing uh, he he was there while I was working on the cut up for this, and then came up with that. And it, uh, I think it just absolutely nails it. We're tired of it. Yeah, gotcha. Okay, now. I have prepared some questions about what's going on in the political sphere in 2018 for you. So I'd love it for you to, I'd love to get your take on some of these things here because I know, here's my first question. I know you've been vocal in your support in the past of Elizabeth Warren. However, many find her claims to Native American heritage coincidental only insofar as it seems to help her advance her own interests as a public figure. So for something that is so hard to substantiate and carries with it a very personal sense of obligation to a community, what's your take on her claims to Indigenous heritage and why do you think that's even important if voters predominantly focus on policy? Well, okay, let's get back to the system again. Okay, so in order to get uh, elected, uh, you have to tell white lies here and there and all that, and I'm not saying that that it is a white lie, that um, she is or is not Native American. Who the fuck cares? How many lies does Trump tell in a fucking single given moment, let alone uh, something that, you know, okay, well, I heard stories that my grandfather was a Cherokee chief or something like that. Whatever. What is your policies going to do for the individual, you know, while you're voting? Well, we're voting for Trump, which lies every other minute out of his mouth and also in instituting policies that don't benefit the people that are voting for him, at least Elizabeth Warren, I can overlook that. Uh, You know, I don't really Mm. fucking care how many porn stars Trump fucked or how many banks he's (laughs) fucked and this and that. This this really doesn't matter to me. It's it's very similar to me, like the the Me Too movement that is going on right now, which is like... Um, once again, let's get back to the system. I don't really fucking care who grabbed whose ass, uh, who looked at whose tits, who said the wrong thing, who came on too strong after a bunch of alcohol and a party, who did this and that. That's not what the Me Too movement should be about. The Me Too movement should be about is why women get paid 73 cents on the dollar, why women hold no positions of power, whether it be in business, industry, entertainment, whatever. Uh, the, the, the problem is, is, is why are men from birth with our educational system taught to feel enabled that we are able to do this stuff? So men aren't doing anything wrong because that's what we've been taught that it's okay to do. Hmm. And when you know, go around um, being like the only way to get ahead in life is to be a subservient and, and to latch on to somebody famous and all that because they have no possibilities of their own. They have to, like, latch on to a man. This is the system that's creating this stuff. So when we start trivializing it and getting into, like, who grabbed whose ass or, or who said what, is Elizabeth mm. Warren Indian or not, is, is, is Trump a serial rapist, liar, misogynist, you know, racist, uh, 
you know, all, all this shit. What kind of system produces these people that makes us vote for these people? Hmm. And, and, and the system is what's sick. It's, it's not the individuals. We're trivializing the whole thing. This this goes back to like the 1960s where, you know, uh, the, the, the marches and the rallies in the 60s and the civil rights and, and, and the gay rights and, and, and all these wonderful topics that needed to be discussed were discussed and then trivialized to where all we got out of the 60s was Woodstock, LSD, pot, and bell bottoms, hmm. you know? Um, yes, and a you few understand, in, yeah. A incremental, a few incremental cosmetic changes, uh, you know, to where, uh, you know, you could have uh, a, a white guy kissing a black girl on TV, like in 1965, with James T. Kirk on the Starship Enterprise and Uhuru. I mean, these are all cosmetic changes. We, we never really get to the bottom of what causes this system because they want to obfuscate and divide and conquer the people, especially through social media now, which is just like a weaponized... It, it, this is more powerful than a nuclear weapon, as we found out, that we've turned the age of information into the age of disinformation. And so people are completely fucking confused, as if they weren't confused enough already. So... We, we're not getting to the issues, and we still aren't, which is what's scary. Like, you know, like just, just the fact that, that people are talking about, like, whether Elizabeth Warren is a, an American Indian or not hmm. shouldn't matter. What is her policies? What does she want to do? And, and does she have the power to actually pull that off? Does she have the capabilities and the wherewithal to steer a, 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 a Congress in a democracy uh, to, to, to bend to the will of the people instead of bending to the will of, of uh, special interests. So yep. these, are, these are topics that we need to discuss instead of all this trivialized chatter, this white noise that goes on, you know, in your head day and night. And this is, this is part of the agenda by the ruling class to make sure that people are divided and conquered and fearful of their neighbors, that they don't look like them, then you should be fearful. Divide and conquer. Keep the people in fear and keep the people preoccupied with how many likes they get on sharing yeah. a video mm. of a rat taking a shower or a cat playing piano as opposed, you know, while, while you're worrying about how many likes you got on sharing some kind of trivial thing, they're taking away our benefits, our pensions. Um, do you understand what I'm saying? This is, yeah, I this get is it, part yeah. Of the you mentioned something really important there that I'd like your opinion on further, okay? So you mentioned the ruling class. You know, a lot of people hypothesize, and I don't want to, there's buzzwords out there, there might be Illuminati or whatever it might be, but is there a system of governance above the American Congress that is controlling things, in your view? Oh, a absolutely, without, without a doubt. I mean, this, is, this has been proven over and over, but, but like... Uh, it, it's just like uh, since the media is controlled by the same people, um, yes, they, they release little nuggets and tidbits of things that are actually happening, like secret space programs, like moon bases, like, uh, mm. you know, reptilians, alien visitations, this and that. Yes. And, and, and what they do is they release it in nuggets and tidbits. And then, and then um, poo-poo the whole thing. Just like, oh, isn't this clever? This is almost as funny as a rat taking a shower. The fact that we have moon bases on the far side of the moon and things like this. Hmm. You know, they, they try and trivialize everything when all these things are actually happening. I'm not a conspiracy nut freak, I swear to you. It's just that... Uh, you know, it's just like the, the, what they do, what they teach us in history, our education system is so fucked up. From day one, not only do we, like, you know, uh, slant the system against women, but we also um, teach us things like, um, you know, if, for instance, sciences, like, okay, archaeology-wise, they've disproven almost every theory that we have in our history books. So history mm. is completely suspect. And, and you wonder why people fall for fake news on social media. It's because we've been trained uh, since day one of our education to believe in fake news. So, of course, we're going to believe in all sorts of crazy conspiracy theories. But when actual scientists start coming up with, like, look, we invented carbon dating, and we can carbon date this to be like civilizations were here 200,000 years yes. ago. Yep. Not... 
six thousand years ago, yep. this and that. So we're we're from birth, and and religion reinforces that with their like you know Jesus walked with dinosaurs, and the world was created in seven days. This and that. These are interpretations by primitive people that we're still going by, and we haven't updated anything. This is, once again, what I'm railing against is the system that we have created or allowed to be created by certain few. So I'm with you completely when you say you're not a conspiracy theorist, because I believe you, neither am I, okay? But there is just it's just so obvious that there has been some sort of extraterrestrial influence in our, in our application of technology. And I'd like to ask you this question on that point. Okay, so... How much influence do you think from, I don't know how else to describe it, because I don't want anybody who's listening to the program to say, okay, well, hang on a sec, you're, but you're a pair of conspiracy nuts and you're talking about things that can't be proven, but the, the rise in the application of technology... But they have, but they have been important. proven. But they have been proven. That's the thing, that they want us to make us think. They want to make us think that it hasn't been proven. And this is all conspiratorial theories. But these things have been proven. I mean, if, if, why, why do you go by carbon dating for certain things, like ar- archaeology, for instance, like, like Lucy, uh, mm. the, the, the primate, uh, yeah. you know, the, the, the Homo erectus that was basically the mother of our, you know, evolution? Uh, that's okay. Carbon dating works for that. But it doesn't work for, like, the flood lines on the sinks, which make it at least 12,000 years older than what they've already established. So, Mm. you know, they they, they just confuse and obfuscate everything. So these things actually have been proven. So, you know, let's let's be careful when we say, you you know what I'm saying? I get it. Yeah, I get it. I just, because, you know, you and I are of the same, cut from the same cloth in the way that we think. And if I try to have these sorts of discussions outside of talking to somebody like yourself, you know, I can see people's eyes glaze over and they start looking at the corner of the room waiting for me to finish whatever I'm saying so that they can change the subject. <laughs> you know. well, that's the story of my life, mate. The story of my life. <laughs> but yeah, I, 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 I truly, I, tr- I truly believe that that's why I'm not Trent Reznor and I don't have a big mansion on the hill and all that shit is because when I start speaking, people just, just roll their eyes and go in the corner and go, when is he going to be finished? Oh, uh, well, well, mate, you can talk as much as you want with me, you know, but hey, I wanna, I'm going to take another right hand turn. I'm going to ask you about right Robert Mueller, because I saw you with a T-shirt on only recently on the Nuclear Blast video that was released to YouTube. So his indictment of 13 Russian operatives for interfering in the US election is contributed significantly to the following. So the Russians paid, so I'm going to throw a few figures at you, so apologies here, there's only two or three, but still. The Russians paid $46,000 to Facebook for advertising prior to the 2016 election. So that really means that that's how much effective financial contribution to the election or to trying to change the election, if we want to put it that way. $1.25 million has attributed has been attributed to Russia's internet research agency monthly spent on its election influence campaign overall. So if it's $46,000 to Facebook, overall, Mueller's um, uh, committee, I think, worked out that they spent $1.25 million overall. However, leveraging that against the combined spend of the Trump and Clinton campaign overall, which was listed as an incredible 100, sorry, not 100, $81 million. So my question to you, Al, is this. Is Mueller's prosecution akin to a witch hunt if you were focusing only on those numbers? Well, first of all, those numbers are, are a lot larger for the Clinton and Trump campaigns. They're, they're each literally around a billion dollars, thanks to Citizens United, a Supreme Court decision. Mm. But uh, what, what Russia is doing is basically taking things out of the American playbook that they did in the 1950s and 60s in South America. They realized that an armed response was too costly, uh, which, which they forgot about when they decided to, like, invade the Middle East and occupy, because conquering is a lot different than actually governing. And, and they found out that that's too expensive. So they just conquered just for the fuck of it uh, to use some of the weapons that we've, uh, you know, spent all this money on. Uh, but uh, what, what we did in South America in the 1950s was, was exactly the playbook that we set up for the Russians to do to ourselves. So I just mm-hmm. figure it's karma. But the whole point is, is that all this is just like fun and games for these people. In the meanwhile, 
uh, look, look what's happening in Yemen and Syria right now. I mean, these people are fucking suffering, man. Yeah. While we're playing war games, like like theoretical war games. It, it, this reminds me of a scene from like The Omen Two, where uh, uh, you know Damien, which is now running a large corporation, is just like, okay, let's start a famine here because it'll make more profit here, correlated through trade. And uh, and these are the kind of things that like uh, places like uh, people like Monsanto and shit do. Like, okay, let's start uh, this here and this here. Like, what's going on in Cape Town, South South Africa now is mind blowing, and nobody's picking up on it because everybody's worried about who Trump fucked and what porn star he paid off. Hmm. Cape Town, South Africa is out of fucking water, mate. So here's the deal, man. But now, now they 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 because of, of um, water restrictions, they've now made it to Ju- July 9th is now called the Zero Day. Which, by the way, I'm working on a song that I'm going to release called Zero Day because we are really approaching Zero Day mm. to where any inhabitant of Cape Town, South Africa, a city uh, of three million people has to go to the army checkpoint to get water for the day if they want to remain in that region because of like um, bad zoning, bad planning, Hmm. um, all sorts of, and of course climate change, which of course is brought on the drought, but these people literally are allowed 10 gallons a day of water, okay? And that includes bathing, washing, eating, and all this. And this is a major metropolis. Now, Los Angeles has been in a drought now for 10 years. Um, you know, yeah, one year last year was okay and it was great. And everyone says, oh, the drought's over. No, it's not over uh, because of the environment and the policies that we've instituted. So um, now, you know, okay, so Cape Town, uh, according to Trump, is, you know, it's in a shithole continent and this and that. And so nobody should pay attention. But don't you understand how that correlates to other major seafaring cities and metropolises mm. like Los Angeles? that we are going to hit zero day very soon in Los Angeles as well. It may not be imminent, and that's that's what politicians do. They only want to look at the imminent. Everything is reactionary as opposed to, like, forward... Yeah, totally agree with that one. It is its own reactive. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's all fucked up, but once again, it gets back down to the system, which is what this whole album's about and and what we Mm. should be thinking about instead of... All the like, you know, he said, she said, who did what, when, where, you know. Uh, let, let's get to the fucking root of the matter here, man. Let's take out the cancer, not the cyst. Mm. Okay, final question for you. Okay, and I'm actually going to ask John if we can link up again because I've only touched the edges here on the questions that I've actually got prepared for you. But, um, mate, my final question for you is that according to Vice Motherboard, Obama's administration sold more weapons than any other since World War II. And many were sold to the Middle East, especially Saudi Arabia. Now, you've been keeping up with things, so you'll know that what's going on in Yemen and the like is a bit of a skirmish between them. Well, it's far more than a skirmish. I shouldn't use that term between them and Saudi Arabia. But Obama won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2009, ironically. And very few, if any, left-leaning artists and celebrities have said anything in public about this. So that's one contentious issue. But what's your take on Obama's legacy? Well, okay, here we go again. Um, Okay, we can point the finger at Obama and that he allowed this to happen, but the reason it had to happen was because of of Bush's policies uh, right before that to start a war in the Middle East to where everyone got freaked out and paranoid to where they all had to defend themselves. And don't tell me that Boeing and, and Northrop weren't, like, shilling their arms, you know, all the arms dealers, fanning that paranoia. And, and building a powder keg in the Middle East. And it's not Bush's fault. It's not Obama's fault. Hmm. It's the military-industrial complex's fault. Do you, like, like we said, do you think these presidents are actually in charge? They're just figureheads. I mean, we can point yes. the finger at Obama oh, to the chronological yeah. dates of like when, when weapons were sold, but those weapons were sold because of policies that were set up for Bush by the military-industrial complex, which made people paranoid enough to do that. And, and like, Trump is not in charge. And, and all these people, they're not in charge. We're all railing against the wrong people. Trump is just really low-hanging fruit because he's such a, a caricature of, of, of such a heathen of a human being. Um, 
almost reptilian in nature with his lack of empathy and lack of curiosity. Um, it, it's incredible, but we, we fixate on that instead of what creates these people and these scenarios. And so, once again, I, I can't comment on Obama or, or Bush hmm. anymore. And I, I spent a large chunk of my life commenting on Bush, really thinking like he was the problem and he is not the problem. Neither is Trump. Neither was Obama. Okay, there you have it. Well, I better end, mate, because I know somebody else is going to call you pretty soon. But look, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, thank you so much for creating the wonderful music you have. Uh, you've enjoyed an outstanding career. Long may you reign and keep on releasing the albums that you do. And here's a final thought. I'd love for you to team up with uh, Jello again and do something under the Lard Banner because Pure Chewing Satisfaction, that's another album that's right up there for me. I would love to do that too. But listen, Andy, I, I, I was serious about the fact that if you... Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I enjoyed participating in it. So if you like that one, there are many more just like it over at scarsandguitars.com. And if you like listening, maybe you like reading, because I've written a book about the podcast. Click on the link in the banner on the website. You'll be taken to a marketplace of your choice, and you can download a sample. And if you do complete the purchase, I want to thank you personally. So please do hit me up. I've got some more information to share with you about the book in the moment, but before we get to that, I need to bid you a fond farewell. My name is Andrew Mackay-Smith, and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast series. Until next time, it is a very good bye for now. This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew Mackay-Smith. I've been the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast since 2017. The first musician I interviewed for the show was David Vincent from Morbid Angel and things have just snowballed from there. In all, I've posted almost 650 podcast episodes featuring conversations with many of the leading lights of rock, heavy metal and beyond. It just got to a point where I thought, I need to write a book about all this, so that's exactly what I did. In Scars and Guitars Volume 1, you'll read a heap of deep reveals and commentary, such as Des Fafara talking about Cold Chamber and why the band will never return. You know, if you're a, a band just starting out, you need to hear me. Do not start a band with partners. Ever. Yeah, wise words there. Sage advice, mate, for anybody. Don't ever, because I, I can't go do Cold Chamber right now unless I get others involved. Phil Anselmo talks about the episode in his career, which gives him the greatest sense of accomplishment. I think the staying power of the, the fans and the staying power of the I, of the songs, you know, whether it's Pantera, Down, or Superjoint, the fans remember the songs. Alex Skolnick from Testament confirms that, yes, playing the guitar in Ozzy's band is anything but an ordinary gig. Will Silent Oz from Demu Borgir write a book? Pa from Sabaton gives advice to people who want to start a band. Look at the team around you, look at the bandmates. If, uh, if the guys want to be on the stage, then it's all cool. If the guys want to be backstage, then it's not going to be cool. Current and former members of Cradle of Filth discuss the band's seminal 90s material. Read about the reaction to George Lynch and Mark from Suicide Silence's comments when they throw shade at then President Donald Trump. We have this idiotic monster, you know, this egotistical, self-aggrandizing, complete piece of shit in there. I, I, I just I just can't understand how we've gotten to this place. And yeah, we kicked a hornet's nest with Sepultura. Percussive overlord Gene Hoagland talks about recording with Chuck Schuldina. Chuck was always, um, you know, he, he was, very, you know, very open-minded, and and he was into having his his musicians that were playing with him just reach out for for the best stuff that they had. Phil Campbell from Motorhead discusses what it takes to get sober. John Five answers his critics who dismiss his tenure with Marilyn Manson. You know, my name is John Five, and Manson gave me that name, and um, I had some of the best years of my life in that band and, and learned a lot. And we get the lowdown on Trey Zagtoth from those who would know, including his mother. All across Scars and Guitars Volume 1, there are moments of tension, relief, tragedy, exhilaration, and throughout it all, you'll obtain insight that I believe no one else has managed to obtain from many of your favourite artists. So treat yourself. 
Scars and Guitars Volume 1 is currently available as an ebook with a print edition on the horizon. Follow the links attached and download a sample. I'm sure you'll be compelled to read the whole book. <laughs>